goals, I want you to know in your heart that God set you up for a time of victory and for a season of great impact. So get ready. Amen? Amen. Amen. And once the video comes, I know you will do me proud and receive the woman of God in with honor and with grace. Amen? So we have a deal, isn't it? Amen? I can count on you, right? Hallelujah. Please go ahead and show the video. Ibuko Awoshika is the chairman First Bank of Nigeria Limited and the founder and CEO of the Chair Center Group, involved in manufacturing, retail, and bank waste security system services. She also chairs a number of corporate and not-for-profit boards across Nigeria and is a fellow and member of several leadership initiatives, corporate organizations, and developmental societies. She has co-founded several organizations one of which include the Women in Business, Management and Public Service, popularly known as WIMBIS. She graduated from the University of Ife, now known as Abafemi Awolowo University, with a degree in chemistry and is an alumna of the Chief Executive Program of Lagos Business School, the Global CEO Program of Wharton, just to name a few. Due to her high interest in social issues, she aspires to use her opportunities in life to further the greatness of Nigeria by raising entrepreneurs who will create jobs for the large unemployed youthful population. She's a multiple award winner of several entrepreneurial awards and a nominee for the prestigious International Women Entrepreneurial Challenge by the U.S. Department of State. As an ordained pastor and founder of the Christian Missionary Fund, she is able to work with hundreds of missionaries spread across Nigeria to change lives with the provision of medical, educational, and other supplies. She is happily married and blessed with three wonderful sons. Ladies, with a standing ovation and a resounding applause, let's welcome to grace the Made for More Conference of 2019, Mrs. Ibuko Awushika. Thank you so much for a very warm welcome. Father Lord, I bless you. I give you praise. I give you glory. I worship you because you are my God. I testify before every single person that is here that but for you in my life, my story will be different. I thank you for loving me even when I did not know you. I thank you for the grace that has seen me through. I thank you for your love that has surrounded me every step of the way. I thank you for your love in my home. I thank you for a husband to be grateful for. I thank you for three wonderful gifts from my womb that you have given to me. I'm grateful for the expression of your gifts and your talents in my life through ministry and through business and every space that you have called me to. I take nothing for granted, Lord. I take nothing for granted, Lord. I take none of your glory. I give it all back to you because I know you are who you are and accept you have been so gracious to me. God knows. Only you will know where I would be. Thank you for this house. Thank you for your son and your daughter. Thank you for their many errands and their alls. Thank you for the people you have called to yourself to gather in this house. Thank you for this conference. Thank you for your women. Thank you for your plan for today. But more importantly, Lord, thank you for your plan for their future. I'm a willing vessel, Lord, totally submitted to you. Thank you for your word in my mouth. I receive the tongue of the learned. I receive a tongue that cannot be resisted. I receive wisdom as you fill my mouth as I open it. I thank you for every life that will be transformed and changed in this place today. I thank you for every woman that will be set loose in this place today. I thank you for every vision that will be renewed today. 
I thank you for every blindness that will drop off today. I thank you, Lord, for every dead heart that will come alive. I thank you, Father, as you will reset every life that has been derailed. I give you praise, oh Lord. I worship you in advance. I give you all the glory. I give you all the praise. I am so grateful. I love you, Father. I love you. I love you. I love you. Kabi esireo Jesu mo jubareo Kabi esire Obaye raye mo jubareo Eyin la rugo ojo Eyin ma lolorun agbalagba
I release power to you. Neima Shanta Kokuria Kaini Maria. Nay Maria, I declare that your tomorrow shall be greater than your today. A Santa Kawuria, that your story shall change from today. A Nay Makaraba Kaini Makuru. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. 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 Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you. If you're waiting for the fruit of the womb, step out. Hai shanta kahuni Maria kasuntu. Nei mo shanta kahuni Maria. Nei mo sontoro boka ini Maria. Nai ni Maria kashanda kahuni Maria kasin. Nei mo ruba kashinti kahuni. Nei mo sontoro. Nai na kasun nei Maria kai. Nei mo sontoro. You worshipped him. I wasn't even here. You blessed him with all your heart. You touched heaven. I'm only the vessel. You touched heaven in your praise and in your worship this morning. Name of Shinti. I'll tell you a story so you can know. I had a gentleman who joined me from the beginning of Christian Missionary Fund for 23 years he served faithfully but for those 23 years no for 24 years because we're going to be 25 next year but he's been married for 23 years for those 23 years he and his wife who is a Muslim girl that became a Christian and her family was really on her case waited on the Lord for the fruit of the womb and the child did not come prayed, we fasted we believed, I cried out to God many times don't let them say, where is this her God, this guy serves you with everything his wife has forsaken all to come, show me mercy, touch this couple, make it happen, but Tony was a cheerful guy, was never sad, you couldn't tell that he didn't have a child you couldn't tell he had been married for 23 years and he was waiting on the Lord. But we kept believing. There were medical situations that almost made it look impossible. But on my first son's birthday this year, 18th of July, they had a set of twin boys. When I announced it, as it turned out, I had to preach the Sunday after I'd found him. And it was the first part of my message. Everybody that knew him could not believe. You mean, even my own staff in the church center group, because all my staff at Christian Missionary Fund are signed as staff of the church center group, but are signed to the ministry. So they can be well paid and they're calm and no worries about ministry work. They were shocked because nobody knew. His attitude, his commitment, his dedication, his focus was on God. He and his wife, they kept at it. And God had to show up. When they came to see me with those boys, his wife said to me, that her mom and her dad died waiting for her to have those children. But her father's only sibling that is left, and Elijah said to her, See, Jesus went on singing You will have a testimony. Amen. You will return and you will testify. Amen. Why? Because Jehovah is God. And there's no question. He's the Almighty by Himself. There's no competition for who He is. And He has total and complete control and power to deal with any situation. I don't have respect for what your situation I don't even want to know. I just want you to know. 
one woman came to your church and she dared to tell you that in the name of the God that she serves and that she trusts that you will return because you will return except his name is not Jehovah I woke up this morning and I couldn't speak I had no voice I all woke up and I laughed when I realized I couldn't I said you devil must be an idiot I'm preaching oh you're my second sermon this morning I stopped somewhere on my way here it's true and I said to the enemy I will preach so I just looked up and said father I need the voice to do the work so open it so don't let anybody scare you do open eye for you my mother is Cameroonian I can speak Kong Pigeon English don't let anybody do open eye for you just when they open the eye to you you open the eye of Jesus on this situation lift up your hands father we thank you the Bible says except you build a house they labor in vain that build it that except you watch over a city the watchmen are awake for nothing except you the creator of the heavens and the universe decide to perfect your will concerning the fruit of the womb and the lives of your daughters we're wasting our time but I know you Lord and your word says to us and your thoughts towards us are thoughts of good and not of evil and you have said that none shall be barren around your table these are your daughters perfect your word perfect your will turn their situation around make them a testimony like Tony and Tony let them use their testimony to bring many into the kingdom for you thank you father for in Jesus name I have prayed go back you will come back I am starting you will return without a doubt you will return without a doubt one last call I'm under instruction I didn't plan this I came up to preach but I know I know when God is moving and my entire life is anchored to the God that I serve there's a critical and urgent need in your life measure it well there's a critical and urgent need in your life you need God to show up step up it's critical and it's urgent it's critical and it's urgent listen to me well it's critical and it's urgent it's critical and it's urgent it's critical and urgent need in your life I have nothing to give you but I know who does and I'm only a mouthpiece critical and it's urgent okay. just stand where you are it's fine we can stop moving just stand where you are and lift your hands to the heavens obarino rode olumeroko abanishi I want you to show me glory. Allah run, Allah run if I. Obato mongo boto sile shobo. Agbani lagbato. Kapiesi. Obami. Uluami. Allah run. Ati ni la imati ni loju. Kabi osi uluwa. A mani kasun to rubu kaini. A mashiti kahuria. Sing this song with me. Ibabo mi duro lori. 
speak your back says my faith is upon Christ the rock of ages that every other ground is sinking sand is your faith upon Christ do you believe him do you trust him do you know him do you love him do you know that there's nothing that he cannot do for you if your confidence is in him, there is nothing that he will not do for you. If God could love you enough to send his son to die upon the cross for you. If you are in this auditorium today and you have not met Jesus, before we pray this prayer, I want you to lift up your hands and say, Lord, I receive you into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. That you will be in right, right standing for that which we're about to receive. <laughs> your power overwhelm every situation. Let every critical and urgent need according to your instruction. Let that need be met right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. As you go back to your seat. I see the light, you call you, Martini. 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 I see the light, you call you,
hands together for Jesus. We worship you. We're grateful. You know, the devil knows the truth. He just leaves the lie. When Oida got to my house this morning, I said to her that when I woke up and I couldn't speak, I know God. And I know how I work with God. I said to her, I said, God is up to something this morning. And the devil is trying to stop me. That is not going to happen. And I knew in my heart, I didn't know what. What time she and I went to Ibad, I went to Pastor Eboda's church to preach. And we stayed overnight. I was going to preach three services the next morning. In the middle of the night, it was, remember, it was serious warfare. I could hardly sleep. It was like a power came and tried to press me down. I couldn't speak. I opened my mouth and I tried to say, I plead the blood of Jesus. I was fighting to confess the word of God. And I knew I was battling. And she was in the next room. And she said, exactly the same time. It was literally like you could see a physical man at the door. I knew that. Well, this man will speak the word of God. And when we got to church, I understood. So, this was not my idea. So I want you to go home and keep thanking God for what you have received. And keep rejoicing for what you have received. Because you will return. And I need you to fight for it and hold it and come back with a definite assurance. Now, today, I need my slides today. I know they set it up for me yesterday, but I move as the Spirit leads me. So, do you have it? Good. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Even though the title there says, because I was meant to use it yesterday. But I followed the Holy Spirit and I, went, I moved as the Lord led me. So I abandoned it. But I know that that's what I'm going to do. So the first slide is the only part that is not as I planned it. But I'm going to talk about playing to win today. That's the title for today. A lot of women know how to play but women don't know how to play to win the strategy for life and you have to have understanding you must be deliberate about the things that you do too many people live accidentally we allow life to just happen we coast along we accept everything that is thrown at us. And many times we say it must be the will of God. But you know how many times we're outside of the will of God and we call it his will. Because if it doesn't align with the word of God, if it doesn't align with the purpose of God for your life, it's not God. And your measures are in the scriptures. If the Bible says his thoughts towards you are thoughts of good, everything that isn't good around you needs to be challenged. But there is wisdom for life. But before you can even know the actions to take, you must have a sense of where you're going. You must have a sense of direction. You must have a view of life. It cannot just happen. Yeah, there's surprises that God throws along your way. But most times you will see that he has prepared you. He has positioned you in ways that you become able to be in the right place at the right time for the things that will come your way. I'm going to ask you a few questions. It's a gift to you. Because I run certain programs. Even though people pay to attend some of the programs and some is token because they're highly subsidized. But I've decided to run a part of it in this session this morning. 
and I want you, thank you, I want you to take it seriously. This is the truth. Because it's important. If you don't define the journey, you can't make the right decisions. Because every decision is for or against something. And you have to know why you're choosing one as compared to the other. Some people marry people that anybody else who has a sense of their life knows that person is not going to help them to get to where they're going. But it's easy for you to make that kind of decision because even you have no sense of where you're going. And women more so than even men live life anyhow. You know, it's important to God that you live the fullness of the life that he called you to. Because you are accountable for the gifts and the talents of God in your life. And the gifts and talents of God in your life is not limited by your gender. I have never read in the Bible where any promises of God are gender sensitive. None. Whatsoever you put your hands to do, you will prosper it. He didn't say men. He was talking about his children. And his children are what? Male and female. Wherever the soles of your, your feet shall touch, I have given to you for a possession. Who was he talking about? His children. Male and female. Every single promise of God is for every single child of his. And if I take it on a national level, the population of Nigeria is literally 50 50. 49 point something men, or 50 point something men, 49 point something women. Statistically, that's 50 50. If you have a country with 50% female population and they are not able to fully express themselves, that country can never even if the men are working at 100% capacity, maximize its productivity. And your ability to compete is limited because you have sitting latent asset. And the biggest latent asset we have as a nation, women and young people. So if for nothing else, you need to pull your weight you need to maximize yourself first for God. Because when you get to heaven, it's every woman and her God. You, it's not about the children or the husband. You will account for your role as a wife to your husband. You will account for your role as a mother to your children. But more importantly, you will account for your life as a child of God. Those other two are subsets of your life. So it's important for you to have a sense of what that life is and why God gave you that gift of life and what he expects you to do with it. And your children and your husband will not be acceptable excuses. Work out your own salvation so that you can deliver on all fronts. But we're going to have this reflective exercise. Oga, because uh -huh. once I'm not controlling it, it's too slow for me. So I want you to take this William Shakespeare's word. These above all to thy own self. I said it yesterday. Many people are already used to lie to themselves because we have so formed an image of ourselves that we have forgotten the truth. And we believe that image and we live it. We act it. But for once, 
to yourself be true. I want you to look in the mirror this morning and say, Iwo, Ibukunluwa. No, no, I'm just giving you. It's your name. You can't, you can't say it for me. I will receive. But I'm talking about you. To look at yourself in the mirror. You are going to write, so I hope you have a notepad or you have your phone or something that you can keep. I will never ask you to read it to me. I don't want to know. You're writing to yourself. So you can be truthful since I'm not going to read it and you don't need to show anybody. But for once in your life, I want you to face your truth as you answer the questions that I will ask you. you there's no cronje involved in this one. So don't look at another person's notes because your situation is different. Your truth is different from the other person's own. So it's to thyself be true. I will say it to you over and over again. But I need you to be true. Next slide. Where are you right now? I don't mean where do you live. And I'm not asking where do you work. I'm not asking if you're at Elevation Church this morning. In terms of your life, where are you in your journey of your life? To thyself be true. Write the most you can because you're not likely to complete all the answers in full today. But I want you to start so that when you go back home, over the next while, you can keep going back to it and you can update, you can delete, you can refine. But I want you to have a conversation with yourself because it will affect everything else that you will do. Where are you right now? Where are you in your journey? Where? You can't play to win without focus or a defined direction. And when I say direction, I don't mean you know specifically, I'll be this, by this year I'll be this. No, you have a sense of it. If you have a sense of something, when you walk into the right opportunity for it, you will know and you will take hold of it. Where are you right now? How many people are still writing? Yeah, I always get dead silence when I ask these questions. Next question. Who do you think you are? What is your view of yourself? Who do you think you are? Ask yourself. Please rise. You'll be grateful later. How many are still writing? How many are not writing at all? As a truth that is hard to tell. Good. Who do you think you are?
Next question. Where do you think that you are going? Do you have a sense of the journey? Where do you think that you're going? I'll ask Pastor Bola that in the women's fellowship after, you have sessions to discuss those questions. Because in my full program, there's seven weeks after the session where the different things are dealt with on a week by week basis and you'll be shocked what will happen so just discuss it as a group and you I think when you get to the end you will understand where do you think you're going My next slide. Now, if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get there? You know, that's not a question for you to answer. It's a question for you to understand why the first three questions are important. Because if you don't know where you're going, are you going to get there? If I'm going to VI from here, I know what my options are. If I miss my way, I will get to a point where I will realize, no, I'm not in the right direction for where I'm going. I can retrace my steps. Why? Because I had a destination. At least a sense of the destination. If you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get there? For you to be victorious, you have to know the things you seek victory in. Because it's so easy. We go to church, we lift up our hands, we sing, we confess, but we don't do the work. We don't. There are principles of life. There are things that we must set told you yesterday is the difference between 20 children that play together for 20 years is why Yoruba people say they do not they don't play together why those things begin to separate them and then you will find at this stage you have friends that were smart you were at school together and now they need you to help to pay their children's school fees or to pay their rent, or to do stuff. Because along the path of life, separation starts. What is my goal? That as the Lord lives and helps me, I would help as many people as can to understand that God meant for all his children to win. But we can't just stay in the spiritual. We need to balance the spiritual and the physical. We must have an understanding of how things work. We must do the work. We must apply ourselves. We must organize ourselves. We must focus. We can't live accidentally. Life is deliberate. God is a deliberate God. When Jesus said, if that I wish that this cup will pass, but not my will, but your will. At that moment, he expressed his pain and his flesh. And God, the father, the heart of a mother, like the heart of a father, like the heart of a mother, would have been drawn to saving his child from the pain of that moment. But he knew that the pain was short term. The bigger assignment was eternal. 
and in line with saving the people he had created. He needed that sacrifice made. And therefore, he ignored the sound of his son's cry and stuck to the plan. And Jesus himself, understanding that, even though he expressed his pain, said, not my will, but yours. And God knew that his will was supreme for that which was eternal. And he made him go to that cross. But he also knew that it's a short-term pain for long-term gain. Your ability to make the right kind of decisions in line with your long-term goal is a function of your understanding of where you're going. A guy wants to marry you. Okay. But you already know the problems with the guy. But you know that God has called you to great things. And you know that that guy cannot support the call of God in your life. Why? For whatever reason. His mindset. His traditional approach. His lack of understanding of the things of God. His inability to accommodate a woman with vision, with power, and with ability to deliver. It cannot be easy to be my husband. Let's be honest. This is the truth. So imagine that I married the wrong guy. My life will be miserable because there will be permanent conflict between the grace and the call of God on my life, the things I want to do, and the power that I'm submitted to. And yet, the callings of God are without repentance. So don't kid yourself. The call of God on your life is without repentance. You are still accountable for that call. You must deliver. But if you don't have a sense of it, I cannot see. Because everybody is harassing me that, oh, you should go and get married. You should do this. The guy has money. He has a good job. He has a good house. His family name is Decent. If I don't have a sense of it, he will seem right or seem manageable in order to silence all the aunties. Tieno Adeo. And then you will marry him. One day of celebration for a lifetime of pain. Why? Because you have no sense of the goal. Because if you do, you will understand that when you get to heaven, God is not going to ask for your husband. He will ask for your ministry as a wife in your husband's life. And therefore, he's not the ultimate thing. Which is why you will wait for the one that the Lord would have prepared for you because he knows what he has called you to. The one who has the capacity to help you. And then you will not be fighting a battle you don't need to fight. Because the victory will already be assured in marrying the right person. I won't have to pray to tell my husband I've been promoted at work. No. Nor will I have to pray to say I have this great business idea. Or opportunity. Because I think that there will be a problem. He will not be able to handle it. He will not be. Thank God for my husband. <laughs> Look. You're here yesterday, today. Pastor Bola and the female leaders in the church have totally been here. She's married to a man who has enough self-assuredness and understanding of the power and the call of God not to think that it's, they should not have gathered so many people without him being around. Have you cited him around here? Why? Because he has the understanding that this child of God or these daughters of God have been called to this ministry even under this house. 
and he had the grace and the liberty to let them be. It's not a marriage seminar. I am just telling you the after effects of the things that we're talking about. Because if I take a hundred women here and I count the issues you are praying about, I would find that 50, 70, 80 could fall, could be resultant effects of the wrong decision of that one situation. If we want to play to win, we have to be submitted to the will of God and trust him. So even if I'm 30 or I'm 40 and the husband hasn't come, but I understand God and the call of God on my life and I'm walking with him and I know where I'm going, I would rather marry at 45 to a man who will help me to be everything God has called me to from that point till the day I die than to have married at 25 and wish to be divorced by 27 or 28. If you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get there? Because along the journey, there are many options. Many curveballs are thrown at you. Many scenarios are placed before you. And you have to make decisions every day. Your entire life is a summation of your daily decisions. Daily choices based on your options determine the life that you have. Your total life is options that you make every day. The process of making those decisions or taking the options is what makes you victorious or not. If you take a job out of desperation that you already know that the boss there tries to sleep with every woman that works there, you set yourself up for trouble. Anyway, let's go on. My last question is a dreamer's question. Go on, next question. Where is my... Ah, I looking for my assistance in these matters. I want you to dream for a minute. I don't know how old you are, but I think there are enough young people in this church that 70 seems like very old. <laughs> but anyway, you can replace the 70 with 80 or 90 or whatever you like. And my question is, how do you picture your life at 70 or 80 or 90 or whatever you choose? The real message is, assuming this is your sign off point and you need to read the book of your life what would you like to read in it remember you haven't lived all of it yet so I'm saying between now and 70 or 80 or 90 whatever you choose assuming is now your 70th birthday and you're about to read the biography of your life what would you like to read in it? Why is it important? You haven't lived it yet. Why is it important? We can walk back from where you are now to where you want to be at 70. We can decide on the steps that need to be corrected. We can decide on the things you must do. We can put plan into place. You can decide to go back to school because you always wanted to be a graduate. And even though you're 50, you're still not a graduate. But who says you had to graduate at 21? If life has kept you out till now, 
but you have decided that your 70 year old self when you are reading your story you want to be known as a woman that went to university is educated you can still go and get it i have seen people that have gone to university even at 60 something write your 70 year old dream a life you haven't lived yet i'm giving you the gift to write how you want to finish how would you like to finish if you can write down how you would like to finish then we'll take it from there mm. too many people are just looking at me You don't have pen and paper or you choose not to write. How do you picture your life at whatever age you want to finish? I'm going to move on because I want to maximize my time. The next slide. My question is then, what is standing between where you are right now? Remember the first question? And where you should be. Where you think you should be. What do you think is standing between them. Sorry, I wish we were just laughing and joking. But I won't achieve the goal with that. We need to answer the hard questions. Because it makes it easier to move forward. You know, at 37, I made a decision that I wanted to go back to school, that I was going to business school. I'd gone to Lagos Business School, I'd done all of that. But I decided I wanted to go and get an MBA. That looked like punishment. I, all my friends thought, they thought I was crazy. What do you need it for? For what? You're already successful. Why do you want to go to school? For what? You, you have nothing to do with money and all of that. And it was the cost of buying a house. So I could have bought a house with the money. But in my heart, I knew I wanted to know more. First, for myself, two, for my business, so that I would not be the stumbling block in building forward. When you employ smart people, you want to be able to embrace their ideas because you yourself, you're knowledgeable. So I had this thirst. As I started preparing to take my GMAT, I found out I was pregnant with my last son. Ah, gosh. So my husband said, forget it. No business school. I thought, okay, she'll be nine months. Now. So as soon as I offloaded, I said, okay, so can I go to business school now? He said, yes. So I had a baby that was like two months or something. When I got myself ready, took my GMAT exam, passed. And six months, it was six months when I went to start business school in Spain. Was it convenient? Absolutely not. I was the CEO of a successful manufacturing company. 
I was Wimbies. We'd already founded Wimbies. We were 30 something when we founded Wimbies. My life looked like I didn't need any additional stress. And then I went for one and a half year program that was hard work. I didn't even know how to use the computer as well as was necessary. They had to ask me to come to school many days before the program will start. And one 18 year old boy, <laughs> one Canadian whiz kid who had set up his first company at 16. It's true. You know, the tech smart kid and his parents had and he wanted a gap year and his parents had sent him to ASA to go and do whatever so they took him on like an intern he was my teacher I had to humble myself and sit calmly with this boy for days as he taught me because I was going to have to do a lot of work on the computer he taught me how to use this was 2003 taught me how to effectively use my computer to do all the work I had to do Teacher and teacher and Jay. But when I think of all that was invested, maybe at the end of the day, my cost was between 120 to 130,000 euros for going to school. The time, the work, the sacrifice, it didn't make sense to anybody else. But I knew in my heart it was something I wanted to do for the future that I wanted. As at that point, I didn't know all of these board things would come. Preparation. When you have God on the inside of you and he inspires and encourages you to take steps in advance of things. If you have a sense of where you're going, you would have the ability to respond, even sacrificially, to choose between buying a house and going to school, to choose between the comfort of playing big scale and humbling myself to become a student. Even with the perfect excuse that I've just had a baby, I could have escaped another few years and say I'm raising a child. So by the time they started asking for CV, for all the board things, what will I write there? But even more than that is the knowledge you need to sit in some places if you don't know it and you get there, you will disgrace yourself. So what's standing between where you are right now and where you think you should be? Why is it important? Because if you dimension your situation and you create your gaps analysis, you can see the gaps and you can then put a plan in place for how to fill the gap at your own pace you can manage your stakeholders my husband and my children were key stakeholders so I got the husband's support to go how do I convince young children on my second term in school they were on their summer holidays Carried all of them, plus my cousin, to act as their nanny. And some days, I would take them to my class. So they can meet my classmates, see the scenario. Because even though they were with me in Barcelona, I would leave them in the hotel from 7 a.m. And sometimes I don't come back till 12 midnight. But they had to understand why. And then when I'm home in between and I'm locked up in the study with schoolwork, they have to know why. Such that if somebody makes any noise in my house, it's my children who say, shh, mommy's studying. Why? I explained my situation to my stakeholders and carried them along 
Because they had to make sacrifices too. Their mommy will go away to school. And sometimes, even though she's home, she's not available. What is the gap? Because you see, when you want to win, you must yourself be prepared. You must equip yourself for the competition. You must equip yourself for the war you want to fight. If somebody passes over you at work and you know that you're qualified, if you have done your work and you know you have delivered, that's when you have the right and the courage to challenge. It's when you can go to the next level and say, Sir, I challenge this recommendation or this assessment. You're not afraid. Why? Because you know you've done your work. I say to people, you can call me anything. But before you go far, I will remind you that I'm good at what I do. And you're going to have to say, okay, yes, we know that. Okay. Settled. Two, that my integrity is above board. And you're going to say, well, everybody knows that one. Okay. I'm telling you real life scenarios. And then, okay, bring on the next issue. You must establish the facts of your life that will affect the victory that you seek. And you mustn't wait until the war comes upon you. Because sometimes by the time you get into the battlefront, there isn't enough time to prepare. It is residual knowledge or residual preparation that helps you to rise to the occasion. I have a five-year plan to get to this position. If you are prepared five years in advance, if the opportunity comes in two or three years, shouldn't you be able to take it? But it's preparation that makes you qualified to take it. My in-laws are bad. Okay. What is your goal where your in-laws are concerned? What is the actual victory that you seek? A peaceful home. Good relationship with your husband. Right? Okay. What are the components of that? Every husband comes with in-laws. Except you've killed all of them. Even if his mother and his father are dead. There's the auntie, the uncle, the cousins. Even if he's alone, you should be afraid. Yes. If you marry a man who has no family, there's a problem. Because there's nobody to report him to. And if he has no one, that's problematic. What is my point? Your end goal is that your home works, that your relationship with your spouse works in a way that you are at peace to pursue the things of your life that are important to you. The in-laws always come with a husband. So how can you then make that your problem? Because if you're thinking strategically about winning in terms of your relationship with your husband and the support you need to have the liberty to run the race of your life, it then means you must work out a strategy to make the in-laws work too. Why? Because they're part of his life. They came before you. They've known themselves much longer than you. It seems like because we said, I do, I do, I wear a ring. Now I'm king and everybody else is nothing. That's stupid. When you want to play to win, you have to think strategically in terms of what your actual goal is. It's not for the pleasure of gisting with your friends about how you dealt with your in-laws. What's that? What value do you get from that? Except that they'll say, hmm, those people are not going to be in your home when there's trouble. So you gain nothing. Stay focused. Remember what is important. What do you want? If you're a career woman, you want the support of your husband. 
and to keep his support. His influencers are important. Why? Because they speak. And what they say will influence and affect him. And therefore, you must nullify the negative effect that can come from the influencers by embracing them with wisdom. My mother-in-law lived with me for 20 years. Yes. My husband loves his mother. How can I love him and not love her on his behalf? That's the truth. I love my husband. I want my home to work. He loves his mother. Why do I want him to be torn between the two of us? His mother. See, I have three sons. I know a lot of young girls want their mother-in-laws to die. Me, I'm not dying for anybody. So any guy, girl that will marry my sons, she will be blessed because she will be my daughter. I'm not looking for daughter-in-laws. I'm looking for daughters. But if she's hoping that I'll die, her husband is somewhere else. Not in my house. So in reality, when you're thinking, you're thinking about your career and your life. But your husband is a part of that. Can he be the only focus? No. Why? Because attached to him is his own family. How do I manage that? What do I need to do? It costs me nothing. Every uncle and Awashika auntie, good morning, uncle. How are you? What's that? Traditional respect is important to them. It costs me nothing. I live my life and I go on. So, Uncle Ekaro, Uncle Ekaro, they know I'll be kneeling down like choo 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 all over the place. <laughs> what does it cost me? Nothing. I'm running the race of my life. I have a husband who supports and encourages me. His family is important to him. They're older than me anyway. So I was brought up in my house to respect people that are older than you. So kneeling down to greet somebody, how is that a problem? Okay, so we want to have a host a family in our house. How can that be a problem? We can afford it. So I just make sure everybody's happy. Why? Because... You're managing the legacy you leave with each person, one person at a time. You want to win. Don't lose sight of your goal. The Bible says that we must seek wisdom. In seeking wisdom, we must seek understanding. Everything we will have to do is not written for us as... Ten commandments. We're going to have to use our brain and extend the principles of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. My in-laws are my neighbors. So at the least, I can love them. I have a sister-in-law that I totally can't cross. And when my husband says, and hey, maybe she shouldn't come to us, I say, no, 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 no. Your mother lives in our house. She loves her daughter. It's me that will now say her daughter should not come and see her. She will come. Ah, but you know, I said, no, don't worry. I can cope. Just leave her. What's my coping mechanism? I just get out of her way. It's true. I'm busy anyway. If she comes to my house and I'm still at home in the morning, my house staff already know. They're just going to keep saying that I'm getting ready. By the time I'm ready, it means I'm coming straight down the stairs and on my way out. And as she said, oh, Mama Ludala, I'm saying, Eka Roma, Ekwelema, yes, ma. And I'm saying, Emma Binuma, money meeting, Musarelo. You know, and I'm answering her, and the ma doesn't drop. 
But I'm getting in the car, and before she sees me again, God help her. <laughs> but there isn't enough time for rancor. Because I don't need it. I need to protect my husband and his peace of mind. And if he has a sister that will cause me pain and therefore cause him trouble, I nullify her effect on me so he can be at peace. And my mother-in-law can be at peace because she can still see her daughter instead of causing war between them. And I get to live my life. And because I travel a lot, I have a lot of house staff, but having my mother-in-law in the house created stability for my children. There was always an adult parent in the house. One day, two house girls can leave. So I had an antidote to that. I always had cousins that were allowed to live with me that I was raising. So that if we went into a crisis mode, there were people to step in and I could still keep to my plans and keep my house working. How do you play to win? Let, let, let me tell you a story. When we just got married, we used to live in a house where the landlord and the landlady were living as well. It was on Bode Thomas. Ah. They were not nice to me. Because I think for whatever reason, I think they had a plan for my husband. And he did not include me. And then I showed up on the scene. And they were wondering where this girl came from. And for some reason, they also didn't understand how a young girl already had a manufacturing factory. And it was not her father's company. Their problem, not mine. Because you must know what is important to you. Other people's problem must not become yours. So, if I come home and I, and I greet them, they will not answer me. Especially the woman. So one day, my friend's mother, I was lamenting. I said, ah, mommy, you know, I don't even know what to do with these people. That I greet them all every time. Because the way the house was, the front part was the townhouse that they lived in. And the other part were apartments. And we lived in the apartment upstairs. There was an apartment downstairs. I have to pass by then. They always have their door open. They were retired people. So every morning I would say, good morning, my head, aroma. So my friend's mother said, ah, yeah, easy. Walking on water alone. I thought, ah, for those that don't speak Yoruba, it means you will greet them and you answer yourself. So I said, ah, mommy, how do I do that? So she said, ah, holy. You just do. I can't run my yes, my other mama. I In your head. You will imagine they answered. And you give them the next answer. And you go on and go on with your life. When I get to my next meeting, does anybody know that I answered, I greeted someone that did not answer me? No. If I decide to be angry and carry the anger into a meeting, I will misbehave. How am I going to let somebody else's problem become my problem? How do you play to win? In a workplace, somebody doesn't like you. Sure. Somebody's problem. The Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. What do you owe that person? Good morning, Mary. How are you? He just says, oh, well, I hope your children are okay. You go on with your life. If you have to work with the person, you will still explain. There's a boss that is harassing you. Especially the one that wants to sleep with you. After you have prayed and you have stoked fire on his head, you go into his office and you shut the door. And you tell him, sir, please never ever speak to me about that again. Ever. 
If you do it, you'll be shocked at how I will react. You'll be shocked at what I will do. You have nothing. <laughs> you shut the door. After you finish, you say, thank you, sir. You open the door and you go out. And every time you see him thereafter, good morning, sir. How are you? Frustrate him with this, sir. Sometimes people run away from a place that they know is good for their career. For what? You will do your job in that kind of place so that there's no excuse. But if there's no system in that place that will protect you, you shut the door on the guy and you tell him, by the time I'm done, even you will not know what happened to you. So don't you ever try me again. Open the door and say, thank you, sir. He'll be afraid of you. He doesn't know if you're a witch. You're a wizard. <laughs> See, there is wisdom in life. And one of the things you must do is you must protect your integrity with everything that you have. Especially for a woman, it is not negotiable. Don't say, okay, let me just sleep with this one for now. I will do it one time. It's a lie. Men gossip more than women. Once the gist goes around that you are a sleeper, you'll be busy sleeping all the way. After a short while, there'll be no good return on investment anymore because a younger finer babe is on the block you must fight for your integrity as a child of God people must be able to testify about who you are you want to be victorious for all times fly the flag of righteousness at every point you might seem slower for a season. Some people might move ahead of you through unrighteousness. But there's a prayer I started praying at a point. Because when I was starting business, I had two principles. I was never going to sleep with a man to get a job, nor was I ever going to pay a bribe. Everybody thought I was some idealistic young woman and I was not going to go far in the business world. Well, I had a simple logic for it. Apart from the fear of God or the way I was brought up, I was an ambitious young woman that wanted to go far. And if you sleep with Mr. A, the first time he can give you the big job. After he has slept with you, the big job is reserved for the next conquest. You're only going to get the crumbs for old time's sake. There's no value there. If you pay a bribe, there's always someone that can pay more. This is the truth. So in reality, those were not, that's why you must learn how to litigate situations, including God. Think rationally about the factors that affect your ability to win in the spaces you want to play. And ask the Lord to give you the wisdom to mitigate those situations. What did I then do? I decided that I was going to offer the best quality product I could deliver and the best service in order to make myself indispensable to any customer. As far as I was concerned, the only mistake you can make is to encounter us once. That once you do, you are not going to go anywhere else. And therefore, I invested my time and my resources in seeking to deliver the best quality product that we could with the best service at the best price. And to show great relationship building with customers to negate bribery. Oh, you will lose some. 
But every time you lose on account of righteousness, you have lost nothing. But if in advance you have not defined your value system, if you haven't defined in advance what your yes is and what your no is, what your truth is, and if you're a child of God, your truth can only be the truth of God. When you are faced with a one billion naira contract and corruption or sleeping to lose it or to get it, you can be compelled by the value to betray yourself. Forgetting that the gain is short term. There's no money you cannot finish spending. Trust me. Give me the right amount. I will show you how to spend it. I just need one or two shops. I will come out totally spending everything. Give me the right card. Send me into Harrods. Or send me into one or two places. You see the bags. And you see the amount. And it doesn't matter how much it is. What does that mean? Money is nothing. So don't base your terms of your victory on material, temporary things. In actual fact, when you win right, you win for the long term. You know, I remember when I was appointed to the board of First Bank, my younger sister looked at me and said, ah, you know, I used to think that Allah said you need. No, no. She said, because I always thought, why do you have to make everything so difficult for yourself? Okay, I will not do this. I will not do this. I will not do this. Why must everything be so hard and so... That life is not so difficult. She said, but you know, now I sit back. And I think, all those people that you guys all started out together in furniture manufacturing, if they made money because of one thing or the other they did, that's all they made. And most of it is already gone. And some of those businesses are no longer here. But your businesses are still here. They're not only here, they're doing well. And on top of that, you're getting into places they can't dream of getting into. Not because our father has shares or anything there. But that same thing that was my foolishness, that commitment to building a life of integrity, not for the world's sake of integrity, it was for the sake of the word of God. It was as I discovered God and I realized it was important to me to keep his word. And I decided that my business was in partnership with him. So there were days I cried as I watched projects that I was 100 times more qualified for go to people that were nowhere near me in terms of ability to deliver. But it's only for a season. A time came when everything came together. The seasons and the environment changed. Corporate governance became a part of the business world. And every major company was seeking for people with certain qualities. This last week, I signed an agreement to chair the global board of a company that my father does not even know exists. Even my son had to ask me, no, are you Nigerian chair or global chair? I said, I am global chair of the company. Yeah. Mm. I don't have a dime of investment in it, but they sought me out and for the last eight months or nine months, we've been having this conversation. And as I was traveling last week, they sent me the contract to sign. And 
I finally signed it on Tuesday because I get, came back on Monday. You know, and I sat down and I thought, you know what, Lord? Only, I don't know how you do this. The founders are one Canadian, one American. The entire board is everybody. Everybody I had to speak to was in one other place. America, the chairman and I met in the outgoing chairman and I met in New York for a final meeting. And then I had to speak to someone in London, someone in uh, Mumbai, and someone was in Cairo, someone was in Hong Kong. I'm a Nigerian girl. I didn't put a dime in it. I don't know them from Adam. But God knows every human being on the face of the earth. God is in every meeting room, in every boardroom, everywhere. And more importantly, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you want to play to win? Play on your terms. And what must those terms be? If you and God are one, your terms will only be God's terms. They will not be separated. And you're going to have to have the courage to stand up for it. Because the world will tell you what's wrong with you. The world will tell you, the world will tell you, look, everything is not black and white. There are grays in between. The, Lord, the world will try to convince you that it's okay to do some things in some other ways. But if you really want to play to win for the long term, you have to trust God and trust his ways and his word. And trust him that even as sometimes you will stand alone, that he's able to take you above the crowd into places that you could never dream of. Listen, you cannot be outstanding except you're standing out of the crowd. And for you to stand out of the crowd, you're going to have the courage to stand for what you know to be your truth. And if you're a child of God, your truth and the truth of the word of God cannot be separate. They have to be the same. The world changes every season. What men describe as right and wrong continues to change. But your truth, if it's not anchored to God, will change with it. But if it is, you will know the truth and that truth will set you free. You'll be flexible, you'll be responsive, you'll be responsive, you will adapt, you will adopt, but your truth will not change. And you will not lose sight of the end game. There are many things that are luxuries that we indulge ourselves in that have no real value. I want to be able to shout and abuse someone. <laughs> oh, no man, nothing but love. To play to win, you must know how to value human beings. The biggest asset on the face of the earth are men and women. Everything you will do in life is through one person. Every door you will walk through, there's a woman or a man at the door. There's someone to open the door or shut it against you. And what decides what they do is based on how they have experienced you. So when you meet people, don't measure them by what they have. Don't measure them by who they are now. Why? You're not their God. You don't know who they will become. Measure them as human beings that God has made. Love them as your neighbor. Leave room for you to be able to say good morning. Never put yourself in a place where you're not able to knock on the door. And it's simply about how you handle people. When people are down, they remember how you made them feel. Because when they get up, they will never forget. But if you make people feel good when they're down, when they get up, they will remember you too. 
Treat people like a treasure because they are. Whether they're the house help in your house or the driver or the gate man, people are mobile. They move. God is the master of every life. The Bible tells you that he can take a poor man and put him on the throne in minutes. It's as he wills. Walk with God's principle that men are mobile and God's designed purpose for them you do not know. But he gave you the solution when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the answer to relationship management. That you will handle every person with care and attention. And the Bible already tells you about strife. So, oh no man nothing but love. It will save you on many days. Life is a journey. And it's unfolded to us every day as we walk through it. You will have your victory in every area that the Lord has called you to. But there is wisdom for the journey. And that wisdom is of God. The courage you need is of God. The Bible says the children of God are as bold as a lion. You must have the courage of conviction to stand for what you know to be your truth. That's how you keep your integrity. Handle all human beings like they count. And don't lose sight of the goal. Once you understand the goal, it's easy to dimension the process. It's why the in-laws become important. Because you can define what your end goal is. It's how you understand that your fr your, the real friends of your husband are important. There is influencers. As you manage the in-laws, you manage his other influencers. And you build your own personal PR with each person, one at a time, based on your action and your interaction with them. May the Lord guide you. Amen. May he lead you. Amen. May you grant you the wisdom that you need. Amen. May you have the grace to discern in every situation Amen. what is right to do and not to do. Amen. May you have the grace of perseverance Amen. to wait for the Lord in every situation Amen. until you get to the right victory. Amen. May you be humble enough in spirit to know that you will not move before God moves. Amen. May you have the grace to understand that everything that glitters is truly not gold. Amen. That everything that seems like success is not necessarily good success. God doesn't waste words. There was no reason for him to define it. For Joshua, that's because there is success that is not good. And if you really want to be victorious, you want your victory to be of the Lord. God bless you. Okay. Hallelujah. Who's blessed in the room today? Amen. Hallelujah. Then I want to hear you put your hands together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, ma. Thank you, ma. Just one more thing. I had almost forgotten and then it just came to mind. So every year at the Made for More conference, we have an exhibition. Just after we say the closing prayer, we then have women who are already set up their, you know, their, they've set up their stands. So please don't rush out, okay? But I remember that at the very first Made for More event that we had, there was just a word that rang out in my spirit. Um, and it seemed like God was saying he was announcing the arrival of the daughters of Zilophihad. He was announcing their coming. And as I probed that word a bit more, God was saying to me that he was raising women of stature, women of industry, 
and that um, they would they would touch their world, they would impact their world. So I just like to ask you to say a blessing on every woman of industry. You might be a woman in career, you might be a woman who runs your own business, you may be amongst the exhibitors, or maybe you were not. We had almost 200 people send in applications to exhibit this year. Sadly, we could only take about 90 or so. So whether or not you have an exhibition stand at the back this morning, if you're a woman and you're doing something with your hands, I want you to just Stretch your hands out this morning. And there's a grace upon um, Pastor Ibukun. A grace, you know, she mentioned yesterday that she would speak to her hands, that these hands have received from God an anointing to make wealth. I want you to receive, stretch out your hands today, expecting to receive a blessing in Jesus' name. Thank you. Can you put the last slide up? The, what is your strategy for achieving your goal? Okay. So that's your assignment. Go home and sit back and map out a strategy for how you want to get to your 70-year-old self. Lift up your hands. Father, we bless you. Father, we thank you. There was a time you sent me around to raise treasurers in the house. And the mark of a treasurer is favor and power upon their hands to make wealth. As these hands I lifted up to you, Lord, I speak for every woman in this house and as many as are watching from anywhere whose heart is set in the same way that the grace that they personally require for the calling that is upon their own lives in terms of their career or their business and to serve as treasurers in your house I release it upon them by your spirit in the name of Jesus. I ask you, Lord, to come upon every single one of them and totally inhabit them. I declare that they are surrounded with your favor as a mighty show. That from today, they will begin to manifest extraordinary favor. And every time they open their mouth anywhere that they go, Lord, you will fill it with wisdom. You will fill it with grace yeah. and you will speak through them yeah. that your purpose for their lives will be fulfilled. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Thank you. For in Jesus' name we have prayed. Yeah. All right, Sister Tony will come up now and um, just give a few instructions regarding the exhibition. But just before we do that, can you permit me just to steal one item from your brief this afternoon? If you are seated in this room and you served on the Made for More 2019 committee, um, the members of the committee that put this together, can I ask that you please rise up on your feet?